And we are live. Hello. Hello, hello. hello. This is Calentir Neal with Dave Woosley, and Hi. we are going to be doing part two of the truth of Amazon's rings of power. And what we mean by the truth is from a spiritual point of view from reading Tolkien's Legendarium or the Middle Earth stories. So Dave, I'm gonna not waste too much time. Uh, we see that Faith is in the house and hopefully um, when her daughter had just called her. So um, hopefully that, you know, she'll get to come back and watch us live. Um, anybody else that comes in live, I'll try to address you when you come in. So um, meanwhile, Dave, um, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself and we'll add the paper to the stream. Okay. Um, I'm Dave Woosley. I'm the, one of the primary founders of TE back in the day, back in uh, 2005 when we, when we first started. It. And I'm, I'm the head researcher. Basically, I, I write a lot of the papers um, for our, our, our organization. And um, this one, th th this paper, it, the topic is Amazon's Rings of Power series, but it, 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 the way that I work, um, within within our our organization, it also has a lot of um, my modus operandi and why that's important for a path based on Tolkien's Legendarium, which ours is. So there's a lot of why things are done the way they are information, as well as just information about Amazon Rings of Power, just that their series uh, gave me a chance to encapsulate everything and uh, explain it. So... Um, now, one of the things, if if you're new uh, to this, you know, if you're seeing this broadcast for the first time, don't know who we are or who I am, um, the re my papers typically have a lot of hyperlinks and endnotes to them. And the reason for that is I'm on the autism spectrum, which means I think a bit differently than ordinary people. And when, I, when I'm very interested in, in a subject, I can keep a whole constellation of concepts and interrelations in my mind at, at the same time. And if, if a person who is interested in our path wants to reconstruct, well, how did this dude, what, what was this dude thinking? Why did he come to the conclusions he did? That's why all the hyperlinks and endnotes are there. Typically, when you read one of my papers, the hyperlinks are of greater importance because it's a, it's a definition in place usually of what's there. The end notes, you don't have to read them when you're reading the paper, but you, uh, it, they're designed. So if you want to know, well, what is this thing he's talking about? What is more information on it? You can go to the end note and there and you'll find that sort of information. And um, of course, people don't have to read uh, the end notes, but if they don't, then they're losing some information that's important to the discussion taking place. Um, and that's a to them, but if you want to understand why I did what I did, it's probably important to read them. So that uh, that's basically a, a little prefatory thing that I was going to do about why the paper is written uh, the way it is. And now we can start. Okay, now Let's we dive now, in. Now, yeah, now we can start the the actual paper. <clears throat> okay, probably everyone knows about Amazon's Rings of Power series, whether they liked it or not it made a huge impact. Um, and um, I'll, I'll start here, start with the paper, Amazon Rings of Power, The Aftermath. This video will show why it is unwise to view any adaptation of Tolkien's works as a shortcut to truly understanding them. The central reason for this is that inherent differences in storytelling are, is that there are inherent differences in storytelling art forms. In addition to the demands of a studio to create a profitable film, and everybody catered to over-cultural expectations, whether it be wokeness, girl power, whatever one you want to call it, uh, will unavoidably introduce distortions in the portrayal. This is true whether the portrayal team is avidly inventing things, as Amazon did, the spurious retcon of the origin of Mithra probably being the most egregious example, or in adaptations in which the director has some respect for the source material, as was reportedly the case with Peter Jackson. Finally, after the film has reached the theaters, or now it is the streaming services, it's an unfortunate truth that humans have an innate tendency to misremember and misattribute. And I give examples of that. Evidence for the latter can be seen 
in the many purported Tolkien quotes online, which contain material he never said or wrote. Traveling backward in time and progressing forwards, we get a few examples. And Lisa doesn't have to show these, but they're basically examples of Tolkien quotes. Uh, probably many, many of them you've seen like a, a, a wizard is neither late nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. To. That's a right from the movies. Um, and by the um, way, yeah, those right. links, they'll work in the document. Um, but the document itself is in the Patreon link, which is down in the description below. And if for some reason you can't access it, um, just send us a note and we'll make sure that you get a copy. Right. Okay. And um, I give I give two of those. One is um, basically on a on a blog uh, written by a person who um, collected these these token quotes, the 10 JR token quotes to live by. Apparently, that was something published on October 4, uh, 2014 that goes all the way back to the previous December of 2013. And um, it's a lot of its movie quotes and things that they say are, were written by Tolkien, but actually weren't. And this this the first reference, the person gives a good um, example of the whole misattribution process. Well, Tolkien said this, uh, and I, I, I'm not sure exactly what takes place because I don't think the way the people that generate these quotes do, but I think it's just because many of them haven't read the source materials, but have seen the movies. So they think that, that a, a movie is basically a, a more or less accurate representation of an author's work. So they say, well, Tolkien said this. And, Which they shouldn't. Yeah, I I'll, mean, no movie, right. in my humble opinion, is is really actually fully accurate of the author's work. Exactly, yeah. Even when the author works with the actual makers, like for instance, like with Harry Potter, with J.K. Rowling, you know, having some input. Exactly. Um, also, uh, like with the series, the Game of Thrones, you know, the, the author had like great input, but they're not the same. And it's, I really believe that it's impossible to make a book or, you know, something written be identical to a movie because it's just not even the same process yeah, at all. I, I yeah, as, as I'm just about yeah. to go into here, it's it's a it's a difference in storytelling art form. So they are going to be different. You know? They're going to be different. Yeah. So they, I mean, it's impossible. But I guess a lot of people don't maybe really know that. Um, and as far as the memory thing is concerned, um, I believe that part of the misremembering and misattributing also goes to people who are actually actively and deliberately trying to change things for their own ends. That so that was also, that also well mixed in with all of this inadvertent, you know, misremembering and all of those types of things. I do think that there are people that want, you know, for us to remember something different. Exactly. Yeah. That's a societal and we're getting programming there. basically. Yeah. <laughs> we're getting there. Okay. And um, I continue in the paper. Why are misattributed quotes relevant? Because Tia Eldelave is a path based upon Tolkien's literary works. We, we, we refer to these as primary sources. Not anyone else's cinematic, theatric, or literary adaptation. However, a problem arises, and here I, I underline, when people think of an adaptation as a primary source. So for example, if somebody thinks uh, Amazon Rings of Power is a primary source, or Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings films are a primary source, they're, they're not accurate with regard to us. If somebody else made a, uh, an, another group based upon one of the movies or, or cinematic art forms, then that's like a different story, but we're based on Tolkien's actual written works. So that, that's why you know misattributions are important because people sometimes think that that's, that's the primary source when it isn't. <clears throat> and uh, I go on uh, to use an actual Tolkien quote. And this is when somebody tried, they wanted to make an animated film while, while he was still um, alive That's right. in the late 60s. And the, the, the screenwriter basically wrote to him and said, well, I, I, th this is what my script looks like. Can you give your uh, 
approval for it? And he said, no, I won't. And he's going through all the reasons why he won't. It's a long letter. It's in letters by J.R.R. Tolkien, but I've extracted this section. He says, the canons of narrative art in any medium cannot be wholly different. And the nature, failure of poor films is often precisely an exaggeration. And in the intrusion of unwanted matter owing to not perceiving where the core of the original lies, emphasis mine. So that's, that's the, the, the main uh, thrust of the argument here, not perceiving where the core of the uh, original lies. So what, it, what that means is oftentimes people will want to put their own worldview or their own spin into the movie that they're making. And you have to be aware that that's just a, a thing that may happen to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, and, you know, nothing is going to be a, 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 a exact copy of the original. If you want that, go to the original source, you know. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and, and I guess that, uh, so Dave, would you say though, and by the way, this might be explained later in the paper, but would you say that when people, um, so because it's impossible for somebody to create something exactly like Tolkien would because, well, they're not Tolkien. They are right. them. They right. have their own experiences. They have their own, you know, I guess, viewpoint and their own inspirations of why they even like Tolkien. Um, would you say that there is a difference, though, between like an, an admiration for the work, but then, you know, the person like just adds their stamp on it, whatever that is, like say for instance, Peter Jackson, or when something is literally like taken into a completely different direction. Oh yeah. Using, that's, that's, like, do you feel that there is a, a benchmark that like, where it's like, oh my gosh, this is deliberately trying to yeah, yes. change everything. Okay. I do because uh, a person who has respect to for an author's works, even if they don't completely understand them, and some of the the portrayals they make might not be the you know the ones that that Tolkien would make or an expert like me would make. Nevertheless, they do have respect for the original source, and they're trying to do their best. Versus yes, so, versus okay. someone who just makes their own thing and has basically nothing to do with it and puts Tolkien's name on it for for basically. And there's credit. the difference. It's yeah. the respect that the material receives, whether the that new creator understands the reasons behind it or not but a deliberate deviation away from the material in order to either mislead or misbrand Tolkien. Exactly. Yeah. Um, in this case. Yeah. I, I can understand that. And I know that you hadn't ever watched them, but I mean, I was seeing it early signs of it and I really did not want that to happen. And I was hoping, no, they'll come back to Tolkien. They'll come back. They'll come back. And, it just kept getting further and further away. And I thought maybe they never read Tolkien before. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I was thinking that, but then, you know, when you're spending the kind of money, at, you know, like in things, you know, and then all the things that are going into it and it's still just so deliberately not Tolkien. To me, that feels like an, a, an effort to, either water down or entirely change Tolkien's canon and Tolkien's exactly. work. Exactly. I, I would say yes to that. Yeah. It's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. And anyway, it's yeah. glad, I'm glad to see that somebody like of a scholarly academic mind, like what you have mm -hmm. <laughs> can see this because I, I see it more as a, like just a regular person with the impression that Amazon it's not that they don't even care. It's that they're literally changing, like they're changing it. Yeah, well, I, I have to state for the for the record, back in the day, I didn't like Peter Jackson's films because I... I, I remember, yeah. The stuff that he was doing, in my point of view, he just took too many liberties with it. But compared to what Amazon did, he was, you know, uh, uh, accurate to the letter. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, yeah. you know, I, 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 I just hadn't had the exposure to someone who really didn't give a shit and was going to do whatever they wanted to do regardless, like Amazon did. Yeah. So there is a, there is a big difference between the two efforts. 
you know. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And I imagine that like, well, first off, if you just watch the series and you've ever read Tolkien at all, you'll notice the discrepancy. And if you've never read Tolkien and have watched the series, we encourage you to read Tolkien. You will understand what we are talking about. Like exactly. probably immediately because the, the, you know, it's not this much difference. It's like this much difference. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I'll go on. Um, although this, that is to say this sort of, you know, uh, re, re adaptation differences can happen to a, to a greater degree, Amazon, or a lesser degree, Peter Jackson's Tolkien films, it is an inherent difference between the written and film narrative art forms, and so can never be completely eliminated, other than producing a film directly from a screenplay with no intervening adaptation. And I say that's a personal preference of mine and some others, and the, the, end, note oh. there goes, the end note there goes to a, uh, a blog entry by someone, why I don't watch movies based upon films that I, that I care about. So that's yeah, a, that's an example from someone else's point of view. Yeah. Um, so what you're saying is that if the author of the work creates the screenplay itself and then follows it, that is a pretty good way of yeah, keeping because, the material in. Yeah, because a screenplay yeah, it, it, it's it, already it, in the format of yeah. something that translates well to a movie. Exactly, uh, because. A screenplay is written for either theatric or cinematic um, actual production, so there, there there isn't any intervening layer from a, a book that has to be uh, uh, adapted. The screenplay is the primary source, so you know it's much yeah. easier to to turn that into a movie. Um, now, whether you know the stuff that happens nowadays, where you know directors get fired and somebody else replaces them, that's a completely different issue. That's more the movie industry type of stuff. But uh, in an uh, ideal, right. in an ideal world, if some a, a screener writes a screenplay and then some but some caring director produces a movie of it, that's much closer to the original than an adaptation from any book. It doesn't matter what the book is, really. So, yeah. Mm. I see. Very good. So I'm lined up okay. with in preparing this document. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. In preparing this document, I found a good article which explains these differences in detail from the point of view of the modern movie watcher. Six important differences between filmed and narrated stories, and there's a link to it, which I already gave Lisa, with a subheading, Treat treating written works like they're movies is a mistake. This article explores these differences from a movie aficionado's point of view, and so maybe more comprehensible for our viewers. Let's go through these six differences in light of Tolkien's written works upon which our path is based, and compare each point to its cinematic variance. And okay, then, uh, so now I switch to displaying that website. Is right. that correct? Yes. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. I will do so right okay. now. So I got to remove this. And. And the first point that they make is films can convey large visuals in detail. And then what I say about that is this is true. However, I don't think it's true to say as they do on the website that text isn't capable of the same feat. After all, a screenwriter designing a film must have some idea of the visual placement of characters and objects. As a visual thinker on the autism spectrum, I also have this ability, but my, my writing talent runs rather to investigative white papers such as this one. In other words, my talent is investigation. My talent isn't storytelling. It's just the essential nature. Some people are born storytellers and some aren't. <clears throat> I'm right. OK, so I've got the screen up um, and I'm double checking to make sure I went back to StreamYard to see if it's appearing correctly. It does look like it's doing well. Yeah. Yeah. If you okay. if you go down a bit, you. you You'll come to their points, and there'll be six listed. They'll, they'll be like a the new okay. one for the first one. There, there it is. Films can convey large visuals in, in detail. Okay. You might want to let the people look through there a little bit. Okay. So number one, films can convey large visuals in detail. Oh, good grief. Hang on. Okay, number two, narration still conveys information better. Uh, 
Um, should I continue, or did you want to show people all? I'll, I'll go ahead and show the okay. um, the um, and for those that want the uh, link here, I'll put this link in the live chat for the for instance. Yes. Yeah. Um. So I'll do that now. Okay. Yeah. So people can follow. And then that way, people can it. look at it right now that are right. on the live stream. Right. And I will put it in the comments after the live stream is done, if you are watching this on replay. And you are free to read this article. Um, and then we will switch back to the paper. Um, we're just we're just covering the uh, the six points right now as a summary. And you can read these in detail. Um, right. Because yeah, what we're here to do is read the paper. <laughs> But this is a lot more reading, right? Like, I mean, like it'll be twice as much right. reading, right? So we're right. just we're just covering the points here. So number three is narration can be more imaginative. Okay, so that that's kind of a given, right? But maybe not. Mm. Maybe not people. You know, they don't really know that. Films benefit from sensory spectacle. So that, that certainly is the case, I would say. Um, so that's number four. Number five is films have trouble with internal conflicts. And yes, because I could see that. <laughs> you, it's really great for outer conflicts because you can see it. Right, yeah. But Two internal people conflicts, that. I would say, would be much better done in narration or by writing. Yeah, it's much easier to represent two people sword fighting than it is to have absolutely, conflicts, you know. <clears throat> and number six is actors can doom their characters. And, and my guess by that is what they mean is that if you have read a work and you imagine particular characters in your mind and then other people you know, they have different, you know, they have a different viewpoint of what that character might look like after they read them, you know, but, but it all like, then you get an actor that represents that and suddenly everybody sees that actor and only that actor as that particular character forever. Exactly. exactly. And also if the, if the screenplay is badly written and the actor really doesn't portray the original character very well, then it's going yes, to and then weird. it's double doom. Now, yeah. I will say yeah. that I do think that in um, the Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson, I think that they had excellent actors. And they had really good costuming and they had a lot of other things so that I don't think that they suffered as much. Now, I will say, though, that I have read that some of the careers of the actors some some of the actors went and got like a lot more work afterward. For instance, Orlando Bloom, who played Legolas, mm -hmm. ended up with tons of movies afterwards. And then the actor that was Frodo, which, you know, he had like smaller roles back when he was a child and, you know, things like that, like in Back to the Future, uh, number two, I believe. Right. And other things. Mm -hmm. Once he did Lord of the Rings as Frodo, because he was so prominent and, and because the character was so, he, he did a really good job of presenting Frodo, but it branded him so much that it was hard for him to get work because just people funny. just, when they looked at him, they saw Frodo. They didn't right. see the character that he was supposed to be in other works until he got older. Then right. he started doing other things and like, you know, kind of doing edgy things and, you know, like where he was kind of the bad guy and, and some other things to kind of break up that particular. So it can doom their characters, but I would even say that sometimes playing those roles can doom their future careers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, but that's the six, um, that's the six topics here. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and exit out of this. And do you do you think that we'll need to go back to this website, Dave? 
We don't have to because now that the people have the link, they can look at it themselves. And so, right, okay. So, you know, I, I just wanted to go over it briefly with them. All, of, all okay, of my points that's in wonderful. The, in the what paper, I'll do is I'll pull up the um, the document again. So right. I'll do that right now. Okay. Uh, so I'm here we are. Have films. Continue with the other half of point one. Okay. Yeah. So you I'm actually the covered these detail, also. Then, so that's great. Right. Yeah. I, I wanted it to be on equal footing so the people could see how we as uh, Tia Alilieva differ from, you know, from something I see. That's based upon movies. So, okay. <clears throat> Uh, I'll, I'll go on. It's probably true to say the thinking in pictures is neither universal nor guaranteed. And I have an end note there to something called aphantasia, which is to say some people apparently can't visualize anything when they read. That's just a neurological difference. And that's just the way it is. So, you know, so you, 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 you can't assume that everybody will remember a scene from a movie or visualize a scene from, from, from a book. It's, there's variations in biology, uh, neurobiology, actually. But uh, you know, uh, you, okay, you I'm a little anything. bit lost. Where are we? Okay. Are we past the okay, list on, now? No, we're on. We're on uh, number one in the list. Okay, uh, I, read the, I read the first paragraph. Okay, of it. No, now I'm now I'm on the second paragraph of it, uh, under number one. Uh, I, okay, where is thinking of pictures is neither universal nor guaranteed. That one uh, under films uh, can under, convey large visual and detail. Yeah. yeah. And I'm on okay. the second paragraph with it there. Under okay, one. so it, we we already read this is true. However, I yeah. don't think yeah. that it is true to say that the right. text isn't capable of the same feat. Right, right, yeah. And that, okay. I'm on the second. It, it is probably true to say, though, that thinking in pictures is neither universal nor guaranteed. It's also to a large degree dependent on the skill and style of the author. Tolkien is a very good describer of situations and landscapes, for example. Leo Tolstoy, on the other hand, in the stream of consciousness monologues found in War and Peace, leaves me with nothing but a confused jumble of images. Because it, the, the, the way that Leo Tolstoy yes. writes, it's very much stream of consciousness, and you, you have to kind of like determine what the what the the character portrayed might actually be thinking and sometimes it's just it's just odd at least from my point of view it's odd and you can't if, figure exactly what's going on you get part of it well and maybe that way. was the point in that particular yeah. work because i think right. that the point was to be confused um meaning right. Of what right right yeah. Tolstoy yeah. was you know like talking about our split in consciousness with you know, when we have trauma and, you right. know, like mm -hmm. the, the things that we actually think about, you know, right. so, but, but I see what you're saying though, because, um, there is right. not really a mystery as far as with Tolkien, how he described it. And what's lovely about Tolkien is that not only was he a, an excellent describer of situations, he did it in a way that was really lyrical and poetic exactly. rather than yeah. dry and academic. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. And now point, point two, this is going to be a long one in my paper because okay. I, go, I, I cite uh, examples from, from Tolkien's works that show what I'm, what I'm talking about. Uh, narration still conveys information better. One can easily see this in the brains as in depiction of Galadriel's character between Amazon show, there is a tempest in me, yeah. and the uh, original sources. And these these are um, uh, Galadriel quotes, these next two. Her but these are quotes was, from Tolkien, not from Amazon. Right, right. Her mother name was Narwin, Man Maiden, and she grew to be tall beyond the measure even of the women of, of the Noldor. She was strong of body, mind, and will, a match for both the war masters and the athletes of the Eldar in the days of their youth. And then the next, the next one is, Galadriel was born in the bliss of Eleanor, but it was not long in the reckoning of the Blessed Realm before that was dimmed, and thereafter she had no peace within. For in, the testing, that, in that testing time of the strife of the Eldar, she was drawn this way and that. She was proud, strong, and self-willed as were all the descendants of Finway, Sif, and Arfin. And like her brother Finrod, of all her kin nearest to her art, she had dreams of far lands and dominions that might be her own to order as she would without tutelage. 
Yet deeper still, the Lord in her, the noble and generous spirit of the Vanyar, and a reverence for the Valar that she could not forget. From her earliest years, she had a marvelous gift of insight into the minds of others, but, but judged them with mercy and understanding, and she withheld her good will from none save only Feanor. In him, she perceived a darkness that she hated and feared, though she did not perceive that the shadow of that same evil had fallen upon the minds of Alden Olor and, and upon her own. And that's a that's that's a, a real difference in there where, you know, in in Amazon yes. series they had her basically pissed off most of the time. That's that's a yes. that, that's the difference between having uh, a strong mind and yet also having mercy. You know, <clears throat> and uh, I end it with uh, no girl power necessary. No girl power. Version. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. PJ's version is somewhere between the two, but it's closer to Tolkien's original. So. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, I mean, it's it's one thing to be angry and, um, you know, that it's OK for female, you know, females to express anger. But it's also OK for all of us to express anger and then all healthfully, you know, like like interface. Exactly. Yeah. With it. Like, so in other words, you know, what I've seen in the show is that they're you know it's like they they do it in a way that like galadriel is the only one that can be angry and and do all of these things and everybody else it, has to go oh galadriel or something it's, like it's, that it's, and, it's almost now i don't know what they were really <laughs> thinking you know not having any access to hollywood or wherever but it almost seems like they they took a character that is filled with what they call now toxic masculinity and just put it put that same persona into a female character and she's pissed off all the time and you know ready to kick ass with it, wh whoever's in her way sort of thing you know it's just it, it doesn't fit the original character so to me it's just it odd. doesn't fit and and even the um the the weakening of some of the male characters by the way you know i guess that and and i'm not really sure if the goal there is to you know, like maybe that there is some kind of like, you know, female empowerment that is, you know, like where, um, you, you know, and I say that a female is empowered only as long as the males are also empowered and, and that they're working together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and sometimes it doesn't feel like that's what's going on. It feels like that it's only her in power and everybody else is like, you know. Now I realize that there it's a well and actually it's kind of a military scene so you know I guess that if she was the leader for whatever reason you follow orders when you're a soldier right so okay <laughs> but right. yeah it just seems like even in other situations that yeah she just is always very angry portraying and and this is not about the actress this is about the writing and, and the actress is just doing her job, right? Like, hey, this is, you know, here's your lines and, and here's how you deliver them, <laughs> you know? Mm. So just saying. Right. Um, we're at point three now, I think. Yeah, Narration yeah. can be more yeah. imaginative. Yeah, and, and uh, the original webpage talks about what they refer to as forehead aliens. In other words, especially in the original uh, late 60s Star Trek, uh, all they would do is put like a little prosthesis on their forehead and then call them some other alien. And it was the, you right. know, the, that, that little right. bump. Well, that and, and it was the 60s. I mean, give yeah. them a break. They didn't right. have CG and right. other things <laughs> to and, help them differentiate. And this, this is an important uh, part here because it's where a lot of people make a mistake. Even people who like Tolkien make this make this mistake, and that's yeah. the, that's the big pointy ears for, for elves. And so yes. that's going to go. In place of the forehead aliens mentioned in point three in in, in the website article, substitute giant eared aliens in Amazon's and to a lesser extent PJ's cinematic efforts. This is a yes. peeve of mine for which there's no textual justification in either the Legendarium nor older folklore. And I, I uh, on that N07, I, I give a link to uh, Morgan Daimler's uh, article on her. Oh, on, excellent. On I love that article. <laughs> but its actual affront is that it ignores the primary descriptor of elvenness, elven quality in Tolkien's works. Elven light often said to emanate from the eyes. And I'll give a few examples here. 
But suddenly her eyes looked into his, and Unhuron knew her. For though they were wild now and full of fear, a light still gleamed in them hard to endure, the elven light that had long ago earned her the name Elithwin, proudest of mortal women in the days of old. And that's from the children of Huron. Yeah. Now, we go, now we go to a quote from the tale of Aragorn and Arwen. Then Aragorn was abashed, for he saw the elven light in her eyes and the wisdom of many days. Yet from that hour, he loved Arwen Undomil, daughter of Elrond. Yeah. And that that's an example of, you know, Elven that the, it, it's always it's it, these are just a few examples, but it, it it's very pervasive within within Tolkien's writings about the Elven light. In, it in is. The eyes. So, and, and, and I go on. Yes. This... And, and and also when um, when Arwen was giving up that aspect of herself in order to be a mortal and married to Aragorn. And she had given that gift to Frodo so that he could go to the Blessed Realm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was off. some kind of that darkness. that like the the light of the Eldar is leaving her. You know. So. Yeah. Well, I, uh, that was another. She, that was another example. <laughs> at, at the very end of the tale of Aragorn and, and and Arwen, when she goes to her death, basically after after Aragorn died, it, it actually says, and, yes. and, the, and the light of her eyes was quenched. So, you know, that's yeah. basically a good explanation of it, a good good rendition. Yes. And, and then I go on here. The, the perception of elvenness can work in reverse also, so, as this fragment from the Tura and his coming to Gondolin shows. And this, I, I had to excerpt this a lot because it's from a very long tale, but uh, and he, there, where it starts, they're in a, um, a cavern, which is actually a hidden entrance to a tunnel under under Gondolin, but they're not sure if they found the right place or not. Uh, but their okay. whispers, but their whispers aroused the sleeping echoes, and they were enlarged and multiplied and ran in the roof and unseen walls, hissing and murmuring as the sound of many stealthy voices. And even as the echoes died in the stone, Tor heard out of the heart of the darkness a voice speak in the elven tongues. First, in the high speech of the Noldor, which he knew not. And then in the tongue of Valerian, though in a manner somewhat strange to his ears, as of a people long sundered from their kin. Stand, it said, stir not, or you will die, be, your fo be you foes or friends. We are friends, said Voronwy. Voronwy is his, 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 his elven uh, guide. We are friends, said Voronwy. Then, then do as we bid, said the voice. Suddenly an elven lantern was unhooded, and its bright way was turned upon Voronwy before, before him. And nothing else could Tour see save a dazzling star in the darkness. And he knew that while that beam was upon him, he could not move, neither to flee nor to run forward. For a moment, they were held thus in the eye of the light. And then a voice spoke again, saying, show your faces. And Veronwy cast back his hood, and his face shone in the ray, hard and clear, as if graven in stone, and Tuar marveled to see its beauty. Then he spoke proudly, saying, know you not whom you see? I am Voronwy, son of Aronwy of the house of Fingolfin, or am I forgotten in my own land after a few years? Far beyond the thought of Middle Earth I have wandered, yet I remember your voice, Elamakal. Then Voronwy will remember also the laws of his land, said the voice. Since by command he went forth, he has the right to return, but not to lead hither any stranger. By this deed his right is void, and he must be led as prisoner to the king's judgment. As for the stranger, he shall be slain or held captive at the judgment of the guard. Lead him hither that I may judge. Then Voronwy led Tor towards the light. And as they drew near, many Noldor, male clad and armed, stepped forward out of the darkness and surrounded them with drawn swords. And Elamakal, captain of the guard, who wore the lamp, looked long and closely at them. This is strange in you, Voronwy, he said. We were long friends. Why then would you set me thus cruelly between the law and my friendship? If you had led hither unbidden one of the other houses of the Nolar, that were enough. But you have brought to the knowledge of the way a mortal man, for by his eyes I perceive his kin. Yet free he can never again go, knowing the secret. And as one of alien kin that has dared to enter, I should slay him, though he be your friend and dear to you. It, it turns out he didn't slay him because he had a Umo's cloak, which had powers that they could detect. But anyway. Oh, uh, um, okay. That's that's. An example uh, in reverse, he can he can uh, uh, tell that 
Ventura is mortal by looking at his eyes. He doesn't have the old. Yes. Eyes, so. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I, I, the last example. Finally, it can be used as a sort of shorthand for elven qualities generally, as a scene in this passage from the un, unpublished epilogue of The Lord of the Rings. Eleanor, that is to say, Sam, Sam Gamgee's first daughter, firstborn daughter. Yes. Eleanor was silent for some time before she spoke again. I did not understand at first what Celeborn meant when he said goodbye to the king, she said. But I think I do now. He knew that the Lady Arwen would stay, but that Galadriel would leave him. I think it was very sad for him. And for you, dear Sam Dad. Her hand felt for his, and his brown hand clasped, clasped her slender fingers. For your treasure went too. I'm glad Frodo of the Ring saw me, but I wish I could remember seeing him. It was sad, Eleanor L., said Sam, kissing her hair. It was, but it isn't now. For why? Well, for one thing, Mr. Frodo has gone where the elven light isn't fading, and he deserved his reward. But I've had mine, too. I've had lots of treasures. I'm a very rich hobbit. And there's one other reason, which I shall whisper to you, a secret I haven't ever told any before to no one, or, nor put in the book yet. Before he went, Mr. Frodo said that my time maybe would come. I can wait. I think maybe we haven't said farewell, farewell for good, but I can wait. I've learned that much from the elves at any rate. Not so troubled about time. And so I think Celeborn is still happy among his trees in an elvish way. His time hasn't come and he isn't tired of his land yet. When he's tired, he can go. And that's, that's an example of the whole differences between humans and elves and how, how it yes. was detectable. If it, if it was based on big ears, they would they would say stuff like she had ears of surpassing beauty. She had so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's so bizarre, right? Now, like you had mentioned to me previously, I can understand it, in in Peter Jackson's renditions, they they weren't that like, you know, blinged. Well, out they made the the points yeah. more subtle. Yeah. So that it was not as exaggerated. What they right. were trying to do, I believe, was to make it recognizable who was an elf, like instantly when they showed up on the screen and who was a human and who was a hobbit. Mm -hmm. Right. And who was an orc. Mm -hmm. So that people that were not familiar with Tolkien could watch the movie and actually try to understand what's going on. That probably makes sense. Uh, yeah. From that, from that point of view. Yeah. Um, but with this uh, knowledge, so Dave, how in your rendition of like, how would you portray this in the movies? Would you have the elves wear white contacts or something or like to make, how would you visually like in a film? I, I would actually use CGI to, um, to create a, a, a sort of subtle luminance from the eyes. In fact, Peter Jackson did something similar from what I read with uh, Galadriel. He actually had off off camera, but yes, but, he did. But facing her, he had like this um, arrangement of small Christmas bulbs, and when it, when the camera would focus in on her eye, you'd get a reflectance. Off yes, the, that's I, I would do something similar, but I'd use modern modern CGI techniques for it. But it would, yeah, it would basically the same idea. Uh, so that that's the way I would I would handle it. Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, I do like that idea. And they did have, because they wanted to see the stars in her eyes. Mm, right. Right. For, for the, for the, um, and, and that did work. Um, I liked how they did it subtly mm -hmm, rather right. than in your face. Right. Well, yeah, if you if you made it look like uh, like sometimes the, the way the Greek gods are portrayed in 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 modern films with like eyes that are glowing, you know, w w whatever it happens to be like. Yeah. Or, yeah. That like, wouldn't work. Yeah, like Aries. In fact, it would look demonic, or, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. if it was like that. Ugh. Yeah, I don't remember which 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 what the series was called, but it was a, it was a relatively recent series made like in 2016, 2017 that dealt with the with the Greek gods and Ares's eyes were always like uh, glowing red, you know, because he, you know, he being the war god. Right. Well, like yeah. being fiery. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 So. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But it, 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 Very you know, interesting. 
I suppose since they were not, you know, not humanoid at all, just just look like it, uh, you know, that that they, in other words, they were not biological, unlike Tolkien's elves. So I suppose you could kind of get away with it, but it still looked weird to me, you know, in, in there. Yeah, their it edition. still was weird, probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And very so interesting. That, so we have, um, now we have uh, number four, the films benefit from sensory, sensory spectacle. Spec uh, and I go, well, there's certainly a lot of spectacle in Amazon's effort. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Including a depiction of the creation of Mithril, which never happened, and a volcanic eruption. Technically, it's uh, the type of eruption is called a pyroclastic flow that wasn't hot. Wow, some folk have all the luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Normally, pyroclastic yeah. flows, it, there, there was a... On the island of Martinique in the Caribbean, there was a. It, it's a. It, if you're interested in in uh, geology or even in just history, I believe it happened in. It happened before 19, 1915, so it may have been like nineteen oh nine or nineteen twelve, something like that. Anyway, there was a, a, a volcanic eruption on that island. A pyroclastic flow came down the volcano slopes and basically cooked the town except for a few people one dude was a prisoner who was in the deepest dungeon because he was a known murderer and uh but he and now the he got he got burned but he was he was survived everybody above ground got basically cooked literally so but, and that's that's the sort of thing you would ha ha really have happen in the in a pyroclastic flow like they were depicting in amazon's rendition and there's no way uh gladio would have been able to survive it without being also cooked unless she has some sort of special force field from uh, star trek or something like that you know i mean th they were really stretching in that in, in that rendition <laughs> yeah <clears throat> yeah for sure so i switched over just to see our comments Mm -hmm. And Astrofell is here. We haven't seen her for a little while. How are you doing? And she says, anger and moderation is different from unmoderated anger. Amazon's LOTR, which I'm guessing Lord of the Rings, Rings of right. Power, mm -hmm. seems to not understand that. That's exactly. very, yeah. that's very apropos. <laughs> very, very good statement there. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah. So I'll go back to the remainder. The, yeah, the, the remainder uh, are, are like only one liners because. Uh, yes. They're, they're very short because. Yeah, it's you, fine. You, all you have to do is think back to the, you know, now I, I didn't watch the, the series directly, but I, I, I had to get an idea of what they were doing. So I, I watch a lot of reviews of it. So I got my my experience of it secondhand, so to speak. But that, yeah. that, was, that was enough. I wouldn't have been able to, to, to watch it directly. I would, I would have gotten too enraged and throw, thrown something at the television. So that, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you couldn't even watch the movies from 20 years ago and, and they didn't even do such, you know, it's uh, weird ass shit. I know. mean, let, let, let's call it. And let's deviations it from yeah. the material. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, and now, now we go. Films have trouble with internal conflicts. And I, I seem to remember yes. an Amazon character talking about internal tempest or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <And> then, <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. And then actors yes. consume their characters. Mm, certain actress named Morphin Clark springs to mind. You know. Now, maybe well, and was... I guess that we'll, um, you know, see the future of. Um, you know, her career, like as things go forward. Um, but she might be where, you know, like her look actually translates well to a lot of other things in movies, you know, across the oh, board. I'm, I'm, so actually this might get her attention career wise. I'm sure, she'll get, I'm sure she'll get future work. I know. Yeah. And by the way, I think she could blend it. Like she doesn't stand out so much to me as Galadriel to be where it dooms her from getting work. Um, right. If anybody looks like Galadriel to me, it would be, you know, Kate, Kate Blanchett from the right. movies 20 right. years ago. I think she did fabulous. Right. I think a lot of people still think of her as Galadriel. Well, e even but it I didn't thought, ruin yeah. Kate Blanchett's career either. Right. I, I, I thought, I thought her portrayal and, um, 
what's his name? The guy who played Aragon, v Vigo Morganson. Oh, Vigo Mortensen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, he was, I, he was I amazing. Thought, I thought both of those were, were very good choices, you know, but, you know. Yeah, and yeah, I'm sure you were aware of the story with Vigo and how he ended up getting that role. Yeah, they said they were going to cast some weird ass dude. I, I saw this. Video they were going to cast this, someone this, else, and then yeah. he went. To, but do you know why he went to the casting? No, no I don't. I, 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 because I his son was an avid Lord of the Rings fan, and and like he read all of Tolkien, and he says, "Dad, you've got to go. You've got to go do this." Interesting. Okay, they may have said that yeah. in the video I watched, but I, I I might have not been able to remember it. But anyway, that, <laughs> that's a, that that's cool. That's useful um, information. So. Yeah, and I mean, it, his son is about the same age as my son, so that'll tell you something. He was a young child mm -hmm. when when that happened. Oh, okay. So anyway, yeah, I, I think his son that tells me how amazing and educated his son is. Right. Yeah. Anyway, a after these six points, I do a little um, conclusion. To summarize, these differences in narrative type are important because literature and films have to be presented differently to be workable. The best method would be to create literature as literature and films as screenplays. It may seem that adapting, adapting a film from a book would be easier than writing a screenplay from scratch. But I would argue that this is actually no more difficult than an adaptation. And in fact, maybe easier, since one would not have to keep these six points in mind, in addition to harmonizing one's creative effort to a pre-existing, very large secondary world such as Tolkien's. So you, they, they, yeah. they, have, they have a number of things working I, uh, against them when they, they, they when they try to make a con a, a uh, an adaptation from a very complex story and it's yes i would agree with that um i guess that adapted. it's more helpful when the author of the work is involved in the process of the screenplays and and right, the right. visuals and you know the sound effects and well, the, you know um, all of those types of things in the um in the harry potter films wasn't the the author Involved yeah, in she was okay, she was so involved on that. some level. Right. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Because yeah, um, she was involved. Um, and in fact, um, I understand that there was an offer to uh, film the Harry Potter, you know, series in America, and she refused because she she said that it's such a British, it has such a British quality to it. Mm -hmm. that it didn't feel right for it to be done in America with American actors and American. So, right. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and I think that it was good for her to make that decision because I mean, the Harry Potter movies, even today stand very mm -hmm. well in, in like in time. <laughs> yeah. My, um, my daughter, Eleanor, um, it was actually named after Sam Gamgee's daughter. Uh, with the, <laughs> yes, your daughter, uh, Eleanor. With, Hi, with Eleanor, the, if you're in the background. <laughs> with, with the same spelling. Anyway, uh, yes. I, I, uh, um, she, she uh, you know, I, 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 as she got older, as she got into preteenhood, became very interested in, in Harry Potter. So I'm like, well, I'm not, I don't have time to read these books, but uh, people have said good things about the film. So I'll, I'll, I'll watch them just to get an idea of what's happening. They were pretty good films. They're good. Yeah. yeah. They're actually good. And what I like about, so I, I mean, I think that there's a few cool things about it. And this is, I'll go on a segue only for a moment and then we'll get back to the paper. I promise. Mm -hmm. What I liked about the Harry Potter movies and also the acting and, and other things that were happening was at first it was hard to believe that like these little kids, right, could do all of these big things that they were doing magically, right? Mm -hmm. But as they were growing, like literally because the cast stayed the same, like, you know, it was the same cast and they were growing themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. They were growing into those roles and you could see them gaining in power, gaining, you know, like the, so to me, the movies actually got better as they went along. Um, mm -hmm. My favorite one was directed, it's number three, The Prisoner of Azkaban, and it has a different director than all the other movies. Oh, interesting, okay. Yeah. 
and 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 you can tell the flavor of it is totally different they're all good but that one just is my favorite one because yeah. It, yeah. it allowed me like the first two movies they were so cute and it seemed mm -hmm. very kid-like and and adorable and all of that but when that third movie came out i was like okay this is going somewhere like even mm -hmm. adults can like <laughs> you know see how this is going you know right and then a new director came in and and i understand that he directed the rest of them and it and it took on a much more like deeper more more mysterious more sinister and you know like just kind of the dark tone of like the dark side in the movie like it it, it right. would really scare kids right. to death right. you know um yeah and and by the way some of it is like not even just monsters and stuff like it's pretty psychological mm -hmm. right you right. know as the movies like grew in you know as the characters grew up and grew into adulthood they were having to deal with bigger and bigger magic and that made sense to me and i and i felt like that that was a really good way that they portrayed and i did like how even the actors kind of evolved together and there was a, a real synergy about that movie series. And to my knowing, I don't remember any other actors like from kids to adults that was like 10 years long where they were in contract. Right. Right. For that long. And then you can actually see them, uh, you know, throughout their growing up even. Mm -hmm. And I do find that it's interesting that like uh, the actor that plays Harry Potter, you know, has went on and done other things, of course. Right. Um, some of the other actors have went on to do other things. Some of them, you know, have said, hey, that was fun. You know, I'm not acting anymore. So, you know, there's that, too. But mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was a unique, very unique part of the Harry Potter series versus every other series that I can think of to date right right but let's get back to uh the alternative to right uh, yeah the, the alternative that is to say the alternative to trying to make a good effort and make something in so as close as possible to uh to the original work if if you're making an adaptation it's just not care and throw arbitrary amounts of money at a film project confident that some <laughs> something will be produced regardless of quality it seems to be exactly what Amazon did. Unfortunately for them, I'm not the only person who doesn't like it. Because if I were, I wouldn't matter. Because they're they're they're, they're based yeah. On, you're not uh, the only person to feel this right, way. Uh, yeah. For yeah. Uh, from an even cursory examination, you type in Amazon Rings of Power uh, on YouTube and see what sort of videos pop up. You know, you you, you don't you yeah. don't put a, any pro or con. You just type in Amazon Rings of Power and, and examine the videos that that come up there. Yeah. The dislike and appropriate seem to be super critical and nearly universal. In other words. I, when I do that now, to some extent, that's based on um, YouTube's algorithm, where it will pick videos similar to the ones you've seen before. But I've I've actually done it uh, in in incognito mode, where I'm not even signed right. in. Right, like I'm, literally, I'm, like not yeah. logged in, just yeah. casually yeah. searching yeah. around. Yeah, and you get yeah. you get very few uh, pro Amazon rings of power. You get a lot negative. Uh, yeah. On them, so. And I'm I'm going to go out on a limb and say all the pro Amazon rings of power never read Tolkien. Exactly. I'll, I'll go out on a limb and and bet that. Yeah, they, you know, and they, they, you know, I, 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 I'm sure given there are cognitive differences in people that, for, 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 for the, you know, there are people out there who, who first came across Tolkien through Amazon Rings of Power and just love Amazon Rings of Power and, and would hate Tolkien's original version. But since our path is yeah. not based on Amazon's, it, it, we're not, we're, we're not the, um, the the spirituality based on Jeff Bezos. That's a completely different thing. You, you have to go somewhere else for that. But <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, meaning that, yeah. um, so that, and, and this is like for a f future announcement for people right. Right. who yeah. are coming to us and wish for us to use Amazon rings of power as a primary source. It is the, not only not the primary source, but it is not a source at all. Exactly. Because we've had things like that happen in the past. It's happened. Yes, we have. It's happened both in, in TE and the other group that that I started called 
Feels I will never rebellious. forget the, a certain group that she'll rename nameless because I'm just not into, you know, all of that. But um, that they would come to us and say, you have to change your path because uh, the movies are right. And I channeled it and I said so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I'm so and so from the whole, you know, I'm the character from, you know, the main character from Tolkien's yeah, Legendarium. Yeah, they were, uh, and yeah, I but, say so. And it's like, the, the group that she's okay. talking about. <laughs> the group that Lisa talking about was. Um, and other kin group, if you don't know what other kin are, you can just uh, yeah, other and kin let's Ricky. not name them, please. And, and they, right, and uh, let's not name them. And and the problem, I I, I understand they're defunct now, um, so don't go looking right. for them. Right. But um, the yeah, pro- we'll just we'll just keep that under our hat. <laughs> this is a public for any, video. <laughs> yeah, and, and for any people who may watch us in the, in the future may have rumors about me. Oh, he's very down on other kin. Why is he like that? Because um, it, it isn't my interest. That's all. I mean, you know, yeah. it, it may very, very well be another kin person's interest, but it's not mine. And I'm also not interested in past life memories, which I don't have and stuff like that. It just doesn't mean. Right. Anything. Right. It's like, it's like trying to sell me on, I don't know, um, bland English food when I'm used to Tex-Mex. I'm just not interested. <laughs> Well, hey, you know, you know how people that want to sell science, they use their science books to try to prove their science. And right, people that right. want to sell religion use their religious books to sell religion. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah, know, it's, it's, it's kind of like that. So they right. think that everybody is aligned with them and that they have to convince everybody that they're the right thing. And then it's like literally they're not even using the body of something that would actually convince them. Exactly. Yeah, that's the to, to my part. That's the secretly amusing. Uh, and as far as the science thing days. is concerned, um, I think that if it was aligned with pure intended science, that that is actually healthy. Meaning, you know, by the by the meaning of science, yeah, meaning well, the definition. The um, but is, what has uh, happened is that because people are involved, and that that's always you know <laughs> that's always a problem. There's other motivations that end up getting mixed in, and therefore it's not pure anymore. Yeah, that. Now and I, I, sometimes I understand even some of the reasons for that. So I have, have compassion for you know some of these things. For instance, you know they might not get funding in order to continue a study yeah. unless a certain result happens. Well, what do you do? Well, yeah, you I, you better find something. I'm, you know, to so it already has a bias so that you get some funding. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just saying that it, it's not even the people's fault sometimes that the science isn't like pure in intention. Well, it's I, I just want, you know, want to make the point. There's here. lots of factors here. I, I just I just want to make the point. I'm science centric myself, but I'm also a shaman. So I don't have a problem treading in either you know, perception or, or reality, but a lot of people do. So a lot of people are only spirituality is irrelevant. Science is crap or only science is irrelevant. Or, or is right. The opposite. Yeah. And then yeah. they don't blend the two. Yeah. Right. And, or and, actually, I, I wouldn't say maybe blend the two, but just know the difference between what one is and what the other is. Exactly. And that's, that's the, yeah. the, 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 the topic of the next, uh, section which yeah we have to do like i guess a follow-up on the science and spirituality one also but right anyway uh, (laughs) it's okay yeah uh the next chapter i should link that video in the description at some point also um the the next chapter mytho historical thinking and tia elderlieva as a chief legendarium researcher and tia elderlieva are frequently engaged in engage in mytho historical thinking since this term is not in common use, so I'll give a brief explanation here. Now I go, uh, I, I explain what it is. Since the early 19th century, there's a, this is a sharp separation between the concepts known as history and mythology. In former days, the distinction was less clear. And this can even be the case in some cultures today. And I, that, that I know goes to uh, a link on modern India and Hinduism and how right. they their worldview is 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 closer to myth historical thinking than it is to scientific thinking, for example. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, 
and I, I go on. However, in the pervasive Western cultural philosophy that developed around this time, known as positive, positivism, history was regarded as true, a recounting of things that quote unquote actually happened, as opposed to mythology, which was regarded as the best explanation for natural phenomena by primitive peoples who did not have access to modern ways of thought and thus was mostly false. I'm not saying that's true, but this is this is the kind of right meaning belief. this is the perception. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this known could, as positivism. Is that yeah. what that yeah. word is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, positivism. Uh, this connection has continued to the present day. For many people the word myth is synonymous with falsehood or false. Uh, yeah. this, this definition completely ignores the sociological cohesive aspect of myth in human societies, however. Myths, religious or otherwise, are those stories that shape our understanding of reality, of how we see the world and our place in it. Myths have, for good or ill, inspired innumerable people, countless cultures, and not a few nations into bold action. And what I mean by that, I didn't give examples there, but I'll tell you here. What, what I mean is, well, for example, the in a good sense, the American Revolution. You came up yes. with, a, with a new system of government that hasn't really existed before, or may have tried to exist before, but it didn't last. Uh, and, you know, you, it was a, a real boon to mankind, which you, you can tell that because a lot of nations in the world copied it. And, yeah. and, and so, you know, they have a constitution, which is similar. They took the, the, what they considered the best ideas from it and made their own constitutions. On, on the other hand, you have something like Nazi Germany, where, you know, we're the, right. we're the, we're the master race and we're going to kill everybody else. You know, so it can yeah. work, it worked for good or bad, but both come out of a mythological point of view. Um, so, and a, yes. a, a sort of ideal. And <clears throat> I, I, I go on, at a more fundamental level, the idea that myths are false does not represent the actual situation. Both history and mythology are creations of the human imagination. History, however, is limited to retrieval of verifiable facts and evidence from the past, which, was, which is regarded as reality, even as it varies from one school of history to another, or even from one historian to another. Mythology has no such limitations. It's not bound by space, chronology, and evidence as is indisputable. Space and time are here created in the mind, just as in a novel, even as it bears a semblance of reality. The nature of folklore is similar, both of what Tolkien referred to as subcreation. Tolkien used the term subcreation to refer to the authorial process of world building and creating myths. In this context, a human author is a little maker creating his own world as a subset within God's primary creation. And then since I'm not a Christian myself, I want to make sure Tolkien was a devout Catholic. So he was coming out of that world. Right. View. So, you know, that's why God is capitalized there. <clears throat> um, like the beings of Middle Earth, Tolkien saw his works as an emulation of the larger creation performed by God, Eru. In his mythical creations or sub-creations that he would call them, it shows how the unseen hand of God is felt far more forcefully in myth than it has ever felt in fiction. Paradoxically, fiction works with facts, albeit invented facts, whereas myth works with truth, albeit truth dressed in disguises. Furthermore, since facts are physical and truth is metaphysical, myth being metaphysical is spiritual. This does not make myths untrue, but it does make them unprovable in the scientific sense that I put in technically right. not falsifiable as, as right, as, meaning as that it's not it's not provable either way. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And get the get the the audio queued up because we're just about to about to go into it the uh, Stephen Holler one. So yes, I, so, so I go how Got then? It lined up. How then does one clarify this somewhat confusing situation? I shall present here a quote from Bishop Stephen Holler uh, lecture, J.R.R. Tolkien's Gnosis for a Day, as he describes it rather better than I can. And now Stephen Holler's going to talk. Well, okay. <clears throat> Switching over now. The 19th century had a kind of exaggerated view of uh, science and of uh, the world of facts. And so anything that is real was factual, and there was no uh, understanding of um, something that can be very true and yet not factual, that there are truths and there are realities which are not factual, you can't prove them, and um, 
that this is a very important reality. This is sort of something that was discarded by the Victorian mind, and I think is still discarded by most people who um, have come to associate their own world view really with that kind of late 19th century uh, Victorian outlook. Uh, yet when you look beyond that, you find that in most ancient spiritual traditions, especially in the ones that are sort of of the alternative nature, the mystical nature, not the not so much the mainstream, there was always um, the understanding of what Henri Corbin and uh, some other uh, modern scholars, especially of um, the Sufi traditions, have called the imaginal world. Now, it's not the same as imaginary, but rather, uh, let's say, the, the Sufi mystics, who are, of course, nominally at least Muslims, tended to explain that, that there is the world within which we live, the created world, then there is God, Allah, but in between that is an imaginal world, to which one gains entry by way of one's imagination. Many of these ideas they have really assimilated from the Neoplatonists and other early sources. And it's hard for us to deal with these ideas because to us something is either true or it isn't true. It's either factually true or it doesn't exist. And yet, think of it a little bit. Ever since the uh, 1840s or so, with the beginning of spiritualism, People have tried to prove the factuality, let us say, of um, life after death, to the factuality of spirits. They haven't. Why? Because it may be true, but it isn't a fact. These things you cannot approach in the same way in which you uh, approach, uh, I don't know, the content of your refrigerator. It has to be approached with a different kind of uh, faculty. And this is the sort of thing that Tolkien was talking about. He says, look, if you use certain certain functions within your own mind, within your own psyche, then you gain entry into this imaginal reality, and it can be of very, very great value and very great use to you. Beautiful. And, and by and the, the way, the I, quote I gave is... A link to the, uh, is typed out in the paper if you need to see it. Right. And if you want to listen so to the whole I'm lecture, to... I, give a link. I give a link to the full lecture, which is on archive.org. In other words, the Wayback Machine, as they used to call it. And a link to the lecture transcript, which my friend Luthien made. Uh, and that, that's in a PDF format. So they're both listed there. And And I'll go on with the paper then. What then is the myth of historical thinking referred to, referred to in this chapter heading? It's a form of working with the imaginal world and receiving imaginal visionary information while keeping one's logic, rationality, and discernment active simultaneously. This allows a perceiver utilizing this method to recognize valid mappings. And there's a, since I'm using that, the word mapping in a mathematical sense, there's a video definition of that, but Lisa doesn't oh, have to play it because okay. it, because that would just distract from the, but it's basically, if, if somebody want to know, well, what is this mapping that he's talking about? I've never heard it used in, the, in that way. That's what I'm talking about. I'm an, I'm a, an amateur ma mathematician and I'm using it in a mathematical sense. So there's a video definition there. Uh, valid mappings between the legendarium and consensus reality. For example, Doggerland, which is uh, basically the continental shelf of Europe, which is underwater now. But in the Ice Age, it wasn't. So you could walk. You could walk basically from France to England easily without getting your feet wet, except for crossing right. streams. Um, and the 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 coastland of Doggerland very much matches um, Tolkien's uh, drawings of the uh, uh, west coast of Middle Earth. So you know there the, there is a there is a non-trivial correspondence there. Um, so anyway, uh, Doggerland you... also has an amazing, um, I remember, gosh, wasn't it like 15 years ago, maybe that, um, they were doing, um, uh, like a large archeological yeah. kind of dig, like with, with machines that like, you know, were bringing up some of the, um, uh, the sea floor. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, and they it, were it, finding it, artifacts that were like thousands of years older than what anybody ever thought that exactly. Would be there. Yeah, in fact, that was one, that was some of the the, the first evidence that there was something unusual. I remember the BBC there. was doing something with that. Yeah, yeah, in that. Um, even, you know, in the past several hundred years, when the fishing fleets expanded and people were fishing the North Sea, occasionally the nets would bring up artifacts on the bottom of the ocean. And like, wow. how the hell did those artifacts get on the bottom of the ocean? And then, like you say, in, 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 the, in the 20th and uh, late 20th and early 21st centuries, uh, people started doing actual archaeological digs underneath the ocean because it's underwater now. And they were bringing up artifacts, you know, and, and, and then some of them were were datable with with carbon 14 and, and, and other techniques so they got a good idea of the time period and it was during the, the during the last glacial maximum that these things were it, you it, it was it, it the the coastline looks very similar to Tolkien's drawings of the west coast of middle earth uh it's just that a lot of that now is underwater because the sea level rise rose a lot you know, now it's rising right. even more but nevertheless <laughs> yeah Doggerland uh, is fascinating yeah. but we'll go ahead and um right Let's see, as well as those ha yeah. having yeah. no so, so, such validity. And then, okay. Right. So, so I, it's someone who uses missile historical thinking because your visionary and your logic and sense of discernment are also are active simultaneously. Unlike a lot of people who channel stuff and then, and then they just, they, they go in like a, a complete. Well, it, it's never verified. Yeah. Yeah. So they just write it down and, yeah. and then for whatever reason, you know, yeah, they don't, uh, attempt to verify this information or as I do. That's the big difference. Um, anyway, uh, you, so you can use mythical historical thinking to get the, get the information. Uh, uh, so you recognize something that does have a valid mapping, as well as it's having no such um, validity, such as the common saying that you may have seen on YouTube videos or whatever. Tolkien derived his alternate words for the Valar, Ainu and Ainur, from the Sumerian Anu, an Anunnaki, the Anunnaki, yeah. yo, the Anunnaki. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, and, and uh, so usually mapping to, uh, to, um, from the imaginal realm onto ordinary reality are of the many to one or many to many varieties. And that, that link on the mathematical definitions explains what I'm talking about here. From the many to one or many to many varieties, they're, they're rarely one to one bijective. This, right. tends, this tends to mislead many people who are used to bijectric mappings in their daily lights, airline or bus schedules, students' grades, the very process of counting items, etc. They often find a chance correspondence, I knew, looks like I knew, and believes that this discovery is the key to understanding what Tolkien wrote. Uh, I wrote the truth, and that's the truth, uh, it's a true way of understanding what Tolkien wrote is close to this quote by French writer. Jean Cacatou, I guess that's how you pronounce it. I'm not that good. With Jean Cacatou? Yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know Spanish, but not French. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, I know uh, how to pronounce French. <laughs> right. Well, one, of, one of Tolkien's contemporaries. I've always preferred mythology to history. History is truth that becomes an, an illusion. Mythology and illusion that becomes reality. And there's, there's, right. a, there's, a, there's a real, like, mind-bending mind bending raps, you know, rap wrapped up in that, in that statement if one takes time to try to understand it. You know, you, you, you'll get a lot out of it, out of the mental exercise. Anyway, um, <clears throat> sometimes mental historical thinking allows one to discover new information related to the legendarium, like my discovery that stellar configurations mentioned in the Lost Tales match actual plotted astro astronomical data in 32,000 and 58,000 BCE. There's good evidence that Tolkien himself thought in this manner, and that's a that, that's a link to um, yes uh, a, a blog that explains it. Um, it's related to shamanism, not but not identical with it. One one can think mythohistorically without demonstrating shamanic talent, for example. Right. So you sure. know, it's it's basically open to anybody. It's just it's just a different worldview. It's a different way of looking right. at the world and your place in it. Right. And, and I go on, uh, <clears throat> for me, thinking mythohistorically is a natural mode, but I've been told by others I trust that that isn't too usual, as one can probably deduce from the plethora of channelings of Ra, Seth, John, etc. Uh, you know, every channeling seems to have a different name of, of some ascended being that they're, that they're channeling. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying, uh, you know. Yeah, that, it's just a different way. Right. And, and, and it may have more specificity to them than they think you know like um 
I, I have I have spiritual allies, but most of the information they give me is about me, not uh, and has to do with 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 my my place in in the world here, not not for people in in general, you know. So I don't claim to be a prophet for everybody. I'm just a prophet for myself. So somewhat of a difference. <laughs> But but yeah. but that again, my allies are self and people are very pragmatic. So it might be you know it's it's it, it's different than an ascended master speaking for the whole species, you know. So and anyway, <clears throat> most people either keep the imaginal and factual separate, and my friend Luthien basically does that because she she comes from a, a science background, also the same as I did, but she doesn't have shamanism or it isn't active yet so she she prefers to keep the imaginal world and the factual separate because she's run across too many cases where people come uh, up blibbering about the anunnaki or you know uh flying saucers that you have to stay in at, after 6 p.m tonight <laughs> the flying saucers are going to abduct you sort of thing you know so <laughs> yeah and, and uh so most people either keep them separate or blend them in a disordered fashion, as some of those channel examples demonstrate. Uh, so I've come across, uh, 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 I've only come across one description that's fairly close match to my own experience, and that's on the native site, powellus.com. And this is a short quotation from it. No division between the spiritual and real world. Before delving into more specific information about, about what American Indians believed, it makes sense to explain that the concept of religion as an organized thing is not really a part of most traditions. Religion describes the division between the natural and the supernatural, which is ruled by one or multiple deities. Native American spirituality does not separate these two concepts in any real way. The spiritual or supernatural world is the same thing as the real world. Every supposed division is completely permeable and people can access everything spiritual just as easily as they can wade in a river or feel the sun on their on their skin and that's from yeah. a, 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 a an article entitled native american religion and spirituality common threads unique beliefs and too many mis misconceptions and i go on um even some with a limited knowledge of native culture can recognize that when living in this way they retain full powers of discernment or they were not have been able to been, be such excellent trackers and natural world observers you know they the yeah the the american military wouldn't have hired Indian trackers uh, if they would just, you know, wander off into the blue and, and not be able to track things or not be able to have any real world practical results, you know? So uh, it's, 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 it's just a different, like um, Bishop Holler said earlier in the, in the excerpt that we played, most people have, have trouble with the sort of a, a permeable boundary between the, imaginal world and the factual world uh, as he said people think is uh, as he says to us things something is either true or it isn't true it's either factually true or right it exist, like so. and, and in a physical yeah. sense like they right. have to have 3d proof of it which you know science i we get it but that doesn't mean that everything that isn't provable by science is a lie or false exactly it does not yeah mean that. yeah but and a lot well, of people I, assume that and the just the yeah the misapprehension of that, I think, is because people think science has a wider area of application than it does. What it what it actually is uh, is a system for uh, deriving information and rules from physical physical results. That's important, and that are reproducible. If they're if they're if they're not physical or they're not reproducible, the scientific method simply doesn't work, and uh, I think a lot of people haven't studied the history of science, so to them they think science equals truth. And if it's if, if science right. can't, can't demonstrate it, that means it's false. But that's not actually the real. That's situation. not what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you can only see that it's a pretty narrow scope of like repeated experiments to do that, and then okay, that's verifiable. And by the way, these are very useful, as you as you note, like mm -hmm. not knowing these things isn't desirable either and and so that's where um we can actually have a lot of trouble with the so-called wider spiritual community that like they think that you know throw science away like you know you can just make up whatever you want 
Yeah, which is also, yeah, I mean, you, and the, you, you know, can do and that. that is not like the best thing to do either. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. Not, not the. I mean, you can do it, but you're going to run into problems relatively quickly. Like, uh, yeah, like, but I mean, it's very, that, like, it's very difficult to navigate the world under it, that. It, if everyone did that, the first thing that would happen is mass starvation because it takes a lot of uh, of energy yes. and knowledge to, to raise crops. You can't just throw seeds in the ground and walk Absolutely. away. Absolutely. Know. Yes, you are correct. <laughs> you so are correct. I, I think that that would be the first failure. And, and then, like, there's other ones, too, actually, that would, right. just, that would just crumble society. Right. If we did not bother with actual scientific method. Exactly. Anyway, yeah. uh, uh, to, to conclude this chapter, I can't explain to you precisely what uh, what thinking mytho-historically feels like, but I can show you a dramatization of aspects of it. If you watch a following episode from Star Trek The Next Generation in, in its entirety, you should have a fairly good idea of what is meant by mytho-historical thinking by the end of it. Or at any rate, I've tried my best, and there's a link in the paper to uh, a, a, an episode from Star Trek: The Next Generation that I uploaded called called Darmok, which is the whole the whole thing. Really, uh, I, I'm not going to spoil it, but if, if people have okay. seen it, they already know what I'm talking about. For people who haven't, you can watch it on your own time. And, and might uh, as well go ahead and put this in the yeah. um, we the can't live chat also. We can't show it here because it's owned by Paramount Corporation, and we'd get an immediate copyright strike. So you know that's just right. Kind of stupid, so <clears throat> yeah, but we can we can give the link in the live right. chat, and again also in the comments later. If you cannot, for whatever reason, download the document, because um, right. we've actually had a couple of people. I have it on a public post in Patreon. You should be able to get the document, but. There's been a couple of people that have said I can't get it, so I went ahead and sent the, them the document. Uh, which, but, which is kind of um, funny because I, I I use this no this this new host PDF host. It's also supposed to work with 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 mobile, but see, I'm not a user of mobile devices. That's that's one of my pet peeves. I don't have right. a cell phone. I'm not going to have one either. Uh, so right, never, yes, I, I understand. <laughs> but nevertheless, this place is supposed to cater to to mobile users. So if it, mobile users can't use it, hey, I've done my best. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're doing our best right now. Yeah. Um, so uh, I I think that I mean you know it's fine. Um, we're reading this on the screen. People get to read it. Um, we're helping them with the links. <laughs> um, so. You know, other than maybe like a couple of the other ones, and and they can just ask us for a copy of your of your paper, and we'll just right. get it to them. That's right. fine. Right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it, I I would recommend actually watching Darmok uh, because it, it it's beyond what I can say. It it, it it's a different since it is a a cinematic. Uh, you know, ex mm. exploration of the whole. It's actually, concept. a very. I mean, I remembered enjoying Star Trek: The Next Generation quite a bit. That was one of the best Star Treks, in my opinion. No, I, you, I think so too. You get you get some of these other Trekkies who say, "No, only the original series." Everything and else I is see crap. that you've made a reference to Battlestar Galactica. Boy, that was an excellent series, yeah. also. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, excellent. And, so I'll go into the next very short chapter, yes. why Amazon series is not useful as a guide to Tolkien's works. Simply put, because it has almost nothing to do with Tolkien's works. And that, that, that EndNote 12 goes to eight reason, eight detailed videos, about an hour each, of why, basically, it, it's they're, they're called um, Everything Wrong with the Rings of Power, and then episode yeah. four, part one, part yeah. two, part three. It, it, it goes up to eight episodes. Um, but but it does have very much to do with the showrunners and Amazon's sociological agenda. And, and this that, is what we were talking about with deliberate rather than inadvertent changing of the material. Right. And I give two links to that because. And two there's two videos. footnotes there. Right. Great. And those are those are two separate videos who examine it from different points of view. So. Uh, okay. And uh, and I, I say it really is that simple. None of Amazon's episodes can be used to gain any insight into Tolkien's worldview 
or insights regarding the Legendarium in any in any way whatsoever. As the Slavons of Battlestar Galactica used to say, end of line, which is yeah. in, in the in the humanoid Slavon, um, they had hybrids, which were basically humanoid women, which are also interlinked with all their ship systems. So they would actually control their 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 base star, their their ship and when they would say they, they they would speak in what some people might think sounds like gibberish but it was actually prophetic information that they were receiving directly um and 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 when i would say end of line that just means i'm through talking right now uh, there's no, there's right. nothing more to be said so right there's nothing else to say yeah 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 nothing else to say um yeah, and I've said in the past, um, after watching season one, and I managed, I was one of the ones in our group to manage to get through all of the episodes. I wanted to see them for what they were. And I will say that at best, it is a fan fiction that borrows names for characters, amongst other things. And maybe exactly. some elements of the world and the feel of it, but it is not at its core related to the stories to me at all. Exactly. Not at all. And, and so anybody exactly. who wants to come to our path, which is totally fine, you can come to our path. We will be basing our path on Tolkien, not on the series and and we don't even base it on the movie so why would we base it on amazon rings of power um and i'm we're just kind of making a video about that aspect because we've had it happen before so this might give yeah, a so person we're... like a little more insight about what we're about um and if you have watched amazon rings of power and enjoyed it which is totally fine we recommend highly that you read actual J.R.R. Tolkien stories. We think that you will understand the quality difference upon doing so. And we we realize that that might take some effort, um, you know, like amongst other things, and we get it because it's like maybe not as easy as turning on the, you know, Amazon Prime and, and things like that. We understand, but we believe that it would be worth your effort. So if you want to get a taste of this, down in the video description, we actually have three videos that we've done on the Elven cosmology that is presented in the first book of the Silmarillion called the Ainu Lindale, which is the song or singing of the Ainuar, which are the beings that came into like, like an existence for singing the world as we know it, and really in a way the universe into existence, the way that we're experiencing it. And we're in the latter stages of that particular creation at this point. And if you're interested in that, we have that on our channel. You don't have to opt in. You can just go to the link, link you know, linktr.ee slash Elven Spiritual Path. You'll see a way to get right to our channel. It'll say, no opt-in, watch Ainu Lindale, and you guys can watch the Elven origin stories that we read and we interpret from a spiritual lens because we are unique that way. And so if that feels like a good thing for you, we might be like something that you want to explore for your spiritual path. And I'll go ahead and let you do your final words here. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Uh some some final words insofar as i can determine i did a lot of research for this to see what to try to find out what what amazon really wanted to do what's their what precisely did they want to say in producing this series and as far as i can determine they wanted a more diverse cast which is statements directly from the show runners that that's what they wanted since pale-skinned humans are apparently now passe in hollywood and I, and I, for a writer with skill, you can actually do that. Uh, you can actually be done while remaining completely within the bounds specified in the Legendarium. My friend Luthien, the webmaster of Il Salonte Valiant, which is a mother group, and the TE Forum, is a friend of such an author named Ruth Lacon. Ruth wrote a short story of what happened immediately after the main battles on the Pelennor Fields, that was this in um, The Lord of the Rings 
called Pelinor Afterwards. She's given me permission to share the PDF with viewers of this video here. And there's a link Very to, the, cool. to the story. Okay. Um, and actually, we'll get this link and share it in the live chat. Why not? Right, right. And uh, of this story, Ruth says, and this, this following is quotations from her in a from a private email. This story is, by the way, structured to work only with from the material Amazon had rights to use to keep it inside the bounds they were stuck with. It could be considerably elaborated outside that, but that's hardly fair. Nor did I dig into some of the wider problems regarding the depiction of different cultures. If you keep it to the storyline token sets, as I suggest in the attached piece, that reduces the problem, but doesn't eliminate it. For example, dwarves really need, uh, need a really good look by somebody who thinks outside the box, set up by Peter Jackson. So do the early hobbits. And then she asks, why in the name of we green apples, uh, the cod Irish accents? A lot of people had trouble with Yes, their, everybody with has our, talked uh, about that. Yeah. <laughs> And, yeah. and as for the accesses, ancestors of the Dunlandings, who were, after all, as J.R.T. himself points out, close relatives of the second house of the Edain and written off by the Numenorians only because their language didn't contribute to Adunaic. What's that talking about? Um, for those who don't know, the Dunlandings were the, uh, um, the enemies of the Rohirrim at the Lord of the Rings uh, era. Um, so, um, but she's saying these people just didn't appear out of nothing. They had their own culture and their own homeland at some point. Point. Yeah. So, so how how do we represent that? Well, once upon a time, I was thinking prehistoric Europe, but some of the less well known and more interesting cultures. If you want diversity in one sense, it's right there in, in the archaeology. Physically female people buried with weapons, and physically male people in feminine dress with tons of jewelry and all. And the artwork can be right outside of the crusade Celtic, late pre-Roman Iron Age at best, pre-Roman Dark Age at worst mold. There's lots of fun stuff to be found. It takes research, as they've already noted, I do my research as well as writing a good story. There's a great deal, deal of unfamiliar, interesting, and even exciting material around. Since I can't resist throwing in a few I ideas in, Eregan is just inland of the marshes around Tharbad which you know from Tolkien's own remarks, are vastly yeah. more extensive than those shown on the Lord of the Rings map. Just as a seaward of them is the major port known, we know that the, that the Numenorians had, Londar on the Greyfold es estuary. So, okay. why not, so why not have marsh Dunlendings living in roundhouses and stilt villages, which you, you've, you've probably seen some prehistoric reconstructions that there, there really were such 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 dwellings march on lands living around houses and stilt villagers using coracles and dramatic war, war canoes with high decorated stem and stern pieces and making gorgeous woodwork whilst controlling the trade between moria and, and numenor both of us as say ruth and her husband alex are also writers of fiction both stories set in middle earth and creations of our own we've always striven to be as true to middle earth to the very uh, striven to be true to middle earth to the very highest standards that, as you can imagine, has made it all the harder to see the wreck that Amazon managed to make of the Rings of Power. It could have been infinitely better. I've written a piece on exactly this for Beyond B Bree, the American Tolkien group connected to Mensa. As it was intended to make sense to an audience outside our usual range, it was necessarily couched in language far different from my usual choice. Nonetheless, I hope you understand what I was trying to do. Put simply, tell them to trust Tolkien. And that all those quotes are from private emails that, that, that she sent me because we, we spoke about it prior to my drafting this paper. And I, and I go on, if you read her story, you'll notice some names which are seemingly invented, such as Hanigal Bati. In this and some other cases, however, they come from published archaeological articles, just not usually published in English. For this word, a Google search brings us to this page. I give it page to a check and i'll put it i'll put the link in for people that are interested okay. um it, it's on czechoslovakian site and I, it, it's all written in in check so you have to take the check text yeah. which i give an example of and run it through, sure. through to google translate and you which has gotten a lot better and you come up with this wonderful um trans uh, translation the inhabitants of kut the inhabitants of elam daughters of the Hanigal Batians. Six of them are tying knots on land. 
six of their knots, the seventh is my deliverance. What they tie at night, I will deliver during the day. It is this level of uh, detail and skill one must aim for to produce any true adaptation of Tolkien's works. To do less is simply to produce another inferior co conversion, as Amazon's already done. Amateurs like Amazon often selectively quote letter number 131 to Milton Waldman, citing, I would draw some of the great tales in fullness and leave many only placed in the scheme and sketch. The cycle should be linked to a majestic whole and not leave scope for other minds and hands wielding paint and music and drama. Yet they almost always omit the final negation that Tolkien wrote, absurd. And I go, why absurd? A good look at Amazon Rings of Power will answer that. Or as my tiger spirit, Richard Parker, likes to say, no talent ain't no excuse, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and look at this list of references. Ding, ding. Okay, lots of links here. Okay, oh, my, one of my favorites. Do Tolkien elves have pointy ears? No. Why do elves have pointed ears? <laughs> and, yeah, and the, history yeah, that... versus mythology. Wow, truth and myth, everything wrong with, okay, like lots and lots of things. So lots and lots of information to look at um, if you are interested. So we'll go ahead and stop sharing that at this moment. So does anyone uh, have any, any, I, I know there aren't many here, but uh, does anyone um, have any Yeah, questions? there was only one comment and I highlighted it earlier um, and it had to do with um, Astrofell says uh, that he, that he thinks that Morphid Clark was a good choice for the character appearance and probably like as far as the blonde and the, and you know, like I could see that I could definitely, mm. I could see that for sure. So that's that's the only comment that we receive that I am um, okay. All right. Other than the anger and moderation, you know right, that right, comment yeah. that well, yeah, earlier well, yeah. came up. So Faith must still okay. be on the phone with um, her daughter, which is understandable. Um, she may just catch the replay. And by the way, anybody catching the replay, don't worry about if you can't put anything in the live chat. Put it in the comments, and we'll get it. Um, right. and will respond. So uh, we're, we're definitely interested in how you feel. And okay, oh, Faith says that she has no comment. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, so yeah, I guess um, we'll go ahead then and wrap this up. Um, we're, we've been on for about an hour and 42 minutes. So We'll let everybody go that needs to go. And okay. she says that she has been listening and she is taking it all in. So wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And uh, so, and and Faith, Astrofell, and like, well, I'm sure that Draco and Nimue will come in later to watch the replay. Um, probably Dekindre, uh, possibly Merlin. Um, you know, there's a, there's a few out there that I was talking to that were going to come today. And, and I mean, I do understand that Mercury, the planet of communication is retrograde right now. Astrophil says lovely paper, Dave. Oh, cool. Thank you. Excellent. So, and actually, let me see if we can, yeah, we can make our faces bigger. So <laughs> we'll do that right now. Cool. Um, so Anyways, we'll um, we'll be seeing you guys later. Uh, we love coming back for you guys. We've, we've been really overwhelmed, but yet overjoyed uh, by comments and and just you know how much it means that we're back on the air and and doing things again. So uh, for our patrons, we're going to be having a social Sunday coming up on the 15th. And so stay tuned with that in your Patreon or in your inbox with your email, or, you know, I often also reach out to our people on Facebook and Instagram messenger. So um, just stay tuned for that. Um, it'll be during the daytime probably 
for that. So uh, daytime meaning in the United States. Right. Okay. Uh, Estrafel says, will there be a link to it because I wasn't here for the full thing? Yes, it's the same link that you're watching right now. It'll it'll refresh and you'll be able to watch the full thing again. So it, it's it's literally the same link that you got here with. And it's a public video, so you'll be able to find it. Okay, so excellent question. Thank you. Yes. And um, if you want a copy of the paper, um, send me an email, Astrofell, send it to elvinspirituality at gmail.com. Tell me that you're Astrofell and you need a copy of the paper and I'll send it to you. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's perfect. Excellent. So we'll go ahead and let everybody go. Um, Faith, have a good night. Um, and hopefully things are going okay with your daughter. Astrofell, thank you for joining us this evening. And you have a wonderful evening. And <laughs> excellent. And we'll let all of you go and have a wonderful, wonderful night. This is Cal and Tierney, Elle and Dave, and we're going to be signing off. Bye, everyone. And we're going to have a good night after all of this. Take care, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye.